Hello, welcome again to Palestinian Diaries. I'm Liana, and today we have um, a very special guest, Professor Sol Takashi. <laughs> Am I pronouncing Close it right? Enough. Close enough. Yes. Yeah. yes. So, um, Professor Sol is um, an expert on uh, Palestinian issues and uh, also teaches human rights, human law, human rights law in a um, university. So, Professor, welcome. Thank you. Thank okay. you very much for having me. Um, we'll dive straight into the questions. Yes, please. Okay. Um, as someone who has spent five years in Palestine and is well-versed on Palestinian issues, could you perhaps um, educate those or share uh, with those watching on um, why there is a glaring lack of political will to advocate for um, permanent ceasefire currently? Yes, well, indeed. Um, I mean, there's a lack of political will, I would say, amongst the powerful Western countries mm. um, uh, and those powerful members of the United Nations. But I, first of all, I, I mean, I'm, I'm guilty of this myself, but mm. I do think it's always important to recall that when we say the international community, mm. um, there are almost 200 countries, and it's not just the West. Yeah. And of course, the West has inordinate, disproportionate mm. uh, influence and power in yeah. these kind of international fora, but mm -hmm. they are not the entire world. Yeah. Um, uh, as to what, and, and we see, you know, we see their double standards mm -hmm. uh, in, when it comes to this issue, the mm -hmm. Palestine issue, mm -hmm. uh, versus the issue in Ukraine, of course. Yeah. And of course, what's happening in Ukraine and Russia's invasion and, mm -hmm. and the atrocities there, the abuses there are, all, of course, you know, they warrant a lot of criticism. And yeah. they, you know, it's good that the international community um, is taking action, mm. but with the with Palestine, we see these double standards, and yeah. it's not you know I'm hardly the first to say that, yeah. and um, you know a lot of countries really at the governmental level outside mm. of the West have been pointing this out and been mm. saying look what is this nonsense yeah. you know you're running around like uh, chickens with your heads cut off about yeah. the Ukraine, yeah. but when it comes to Palestine, it's like full throttle behind yeah. the oppressor mm. and the uh, war crimes. Yes. Uh, the, and Israel and its committing of war crimes. So, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of countries are, in fact, mm -hmm. on board with all of this and on board with mm -hmm. um, the recognition of, of human rights and the recognition of Palestinian rights. Mm -hmm. So it really is just, you know, the West. It's really the Western countries. Yeah, well, Why is that the case? You know, yes. there's a lot of, you know, there are a lot of sort of different sort of mm -hmm. things going on here. But mm -hmm. what I would say certainly is that they have their geopolitical interests uh, in mind. Mm -hmm. And... In their minds, um, you know, they're still living in a world where they can dictate the terms of mm. everything to the rest of the world, and mm. where the world centers on on Western Europe and on the West in mm. general. And you know, they believe that Israel is their ally in right. a resource-rich and very sort of geopolitically strategic region. Right. So right. you know, they 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 support Israel mm. mainly. I would say mainly because of that. But it's, uh, you know, but they're it is really. Yes, sorry. Go ahead. Sort of like glaringly obvious that they're, what they're doing is against international laws. Yes, yeah, so it's, it's, it's yeah. very clear that what yeah. Israel is doing is against international law. There can't be any kind of doubt to this. Um, yes. You know, every single, since 2008, well, mm. 2007, Israel started the blockade of Gaza, the closure yep. of Gaza. Mm. Um, that in itself is already collective punishment and, yeah. in, and in, in and of itself already a violation mm. of international law. And then we see, you know, there are all the sort of litany of, of war crimes and yeah. violations that Italy, uh, excuse me, that Israel yeah. has committed and continues to commit. But mm. there have been these, um, you know, these almost regular major military offensives from, mm. you know, from the end of 2008 to, 2000, to the beginning of 2009, and then yeah. 2012, 2014, 2021. These are just, you know, the big ones. Yeah. Um, and each and every one of them has been characterized by a blatant disregard for yeah, international law yeah. and for civilian, mm. you know, civilian See. lives and everything. Mm. But up till now, um, up till this current, you know, string of massacres, mm. they've been sort of, I wouldn't say they've been uh, cautious, but certainly they've, they've made efforts mm. to justify their actions. Uh, yeah. Some of these efforts have, have been often quite ludicrous and ridiculous, yes. yeah. but up till you know, this current offensive, mm. you know, they, they've at least sort of made some sort of effort. Mm. 
I'm not, you know, I'm not saying that the efforts have been successful or, or, <laughs> or convincing, but at yeah. least they've tried. This time around, uh, certainly until the whole, you know, the Al Shifa and all the hospitals, yeah. they didn't even bother. Mm. And frankly, you know, aside from the hospitals, they aren't even bothering. Mm. Uh, they don't bother to sort of show that they're targeting uh, uh, Hamas combatants. Mm. Which, um, which, but you they know, claim to. Which they, they do, they do yeah. make these sort of vague and over and yeah. sweeping claims, but yeah. it, it's obvious, it's clear as the light of day that mm. they aren't. And even if they were, this is really important, mm. even if they were targeting military facilities mm. or combatants, mm. you know, the loss of life, civilian life, and the damage to civilian infrastructure is clearly, you know, clear as the light of day, it yeah. is disproportionate. And that very. is already, you know, a violation of international law and, yeah. and a very grave war crime which they're mm -hmm. committing. So, you know, it, it's just obvious. It is, it is completely blatant and obvious. Mm -hmm. But what I think we see, you know, getting back to your original question, yeah. with the West is, you know, I, I think we're, we're seeing in a very blatant way their double standards and mm -hmm. their attitudes that, you know, the laws are for thee and not for me. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they are... We look back at the United States and its invasion in you know 2003 of Iraq and, yeah. and all the the, the, occup the occupation of Afghanistan, which lasted of, you know, over 20 years, mm. uh, Iraq, Libya, yeah. you know, all these kind of things, and the mm. sort of general under the rubric of the global war on terror, the general sort of impunity yeah. with which uh, the United States in particular and the other <laughs> Western countries yes, as it's well. Very blatant, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's very blatant, yeah. and they want to create. I mean, already in their minds, they already have, but they want to solidify this situation where they have absolute impunity. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, in their mind, what Israel is doing now is just sort of the, the model, the test case in a way for, mm -hmm. for what they want to, you know, the world that they want to create. Or, they, mm -hmm. or in their minds, they want to believe they already have mm -hmm. and want to continue on. Right. Utter impunity for them and their allies, mm -hmm. uh, international law and, you mm -hmm. know, criticism for everybody else. Mm -hmm. But is there no no way um, for for the world or for countries to put more international mm -hmm. pressure on them, say Israel and the United States, to go for a permanent truce, a permanent cease sorry, a permanent ceasefire? Is there is there a way? Well, I mean, certainly there is. Uh, um, I mean, you know, in the legal structures and the sort of you know the the the. The, me the, the methods of the, mm -hmm. of the UN and of the, internet, the rules of international diplomacy and all of that and the International Criminal Court. Of course, there's a way, there are ways. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the issue is not so much uh, the legal avenues and that they are not, um, they're not in theory, theoretically yeah. available. It's mm -hmm. that they are being blocked by political actors. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, what needs to happen is there has to be a there has to be a change in political will. There has to be mm -hmm. basically more pressure put on um, the West mm -hmm. and on Israel, and in particular the United States, because the, the, you know, the solution is not gonna come from within Israel. I really do not believe this is gonna yes. happen. Mm -hmm. The solution has to come from within the United States. Mm -hmm. And it's already happening. And see, this is the thing. I mean, mm -hmm. if we look back, for example, in the other, to the other apartheid state uh, yeah. that we had in, in recent times, South mm -hmm. Africa, mm -hmm. you know, it was not the Western countries that started the boycott of South Africa. No way. I mean, they had to be dragged kicking and screaming to the yeah. table for this. <laughs> yes. It really was, you know, it was the rest of the world and it was mainly the citizenry of, um, of the rest of the world and also of the West. So mm -hmm. what I'm saying is it was really the, you know, the citizens mm -hmm. uh, that, the normal people that started the boycott and really mm -hmm. pushed it forward and really pushed, put pressure mm -hmm. on uh, the governments. And that's what really led to change. Mm -hmm. So that's what needs to happen, and that is already happening. I yes. mean, you know, the, the amazing but is it enough? Story. Do you think there should be like more efforts? Well, at, at, right now it's not enough yeah, because yeah. it hasn't happened yet. Yeah, but yeah. I think there has to be continued efforts and right. continued efforts mm -hmm. through not only, you know, getting out in the streets and demonstrating, that's mm -hmm. also extremely important and very mm -hmm. important, mm -hmm. but also through, you know, political organizing yeah. um, in, you know, in all of these countries. And again, you know, we, we, it's happening. For sure it's already happening. Mm -hmm. And that's why the backlash, mm -hmm. the Zionist backlash mm -hmm. in countries like the United States and yeah. more and more the UK and, mm -hmm. you know, the rest of the West, mm -hmm. that's why it's getting so severe because they see they've lost the, the battle for uh, you know, public opinion, the yeah. battle of narrative, so yeah. to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, the oppression that's taking place 
uh, for example, in universities in the United States and also the UK, mm. um, and we see you know celebrities and mm. Hollywood people who speak out are being you yeah, know, canceled and canned, yeah, yeah. and you know we see this everywhere. But they yeah. they they're doing this because they see they've lost. They mm. do they're doing this because they see the writing is on the wall. Mm. So now really is the time to you know continue the pressure, mm -hmm. and to co continue to uh, to pressure the government yeah. and advocate for Palestinian rights. So currently, during the truce, um, uh, there's been uh, some aid trucks entering uh, Palestine, but not enough actually to yes. cover the no, 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 so no, about, Nowhere near enough. Yeah, so there's about um, roughly, I've read, 150 trucks um, going in daily, and some reporters on the ground have been saying that that's not nearly enough to cover everything, that they've been needing 250 to 300 trucks um, daily entering. Gaza. So perhaps you can share with us, um, like paint a picture for our listeners, how does aid enter Gaza and like what are the restrictions and what are the requirements in order for these aid trucks to enter Gaza, like not even just during this war. Like right, right, yeah, sure. Happening. Yeah. Well, I mean, look, from 2007, Israel started its uh, blockade of Gaza, mm. its closure of Gaza. And so essentially, um, people were, as a general rule, not allowed to go out mm. from Gaza. Mm. Uh, and people, and any kind of aid, any anything mm. crossing from Israel into Gaza had mm. been subjected to extremely severe restrictions. Now, mm -hmm. these those restrictions are were, and I would say remain, very arbitrary, yeah. vague, mm. and you know just generally uh, unclear. Right. And that's how Israel, that's one of the ways in which Israel keeps, you know, its adversaries on their toes mm -hmm. and, and is able to sort of exert this kind of arbitrary authority at yeah. any time. Mm -hmm. What was happening, though, was like even foodstuffs mm -hmm. were subject to restrictions. What was yeah. happening, and this is not me making this up, yeah. there was an Israeli NGO that you know, used a freedom of information request to get this information mm -hmm. from within the government. Mm -hmm. But the IDF, so the Israeli military, was mm -hmm. calculating on the basis of the population of Gaza mm -hmm. how many calories people oh. needed to just remain above the starvation line. So we don't want them, you know, content. We don't right. want them, you know, happy. Uh. We want them to be very unhappy with Hamas and, and very unhappy with the situation. Right. But we don't want them to starve to death because if people are starving to death in the streets, uh. then of course people, the international community is going to start blaming Israel. So yeah. you know, but they were already were, doing that. Anyways. Yeah. Well, now oh, yeah. now <laughs> it's now it's beyond you yes. know beyond any kind of consideration. Right. But so they were doing these kind of things, and mm -hmm. you know, it's it's. And those those particular sort of calorie count restrictions were, mm -hmm. you know, they were enforced at a certain point. But they, they, there's no kind of announcement that, mm -hmm. oh, okay, from this day on, we're going to allow this going in, but we're not going to allow that going in. Mm -hmm. It's extremely arbitrary. At a certain point, pasta mm -hmm. was not allowed into Gaza. I mean, it was oh. crazy. It was crazy. Why was um, that? I mean, look, it, no it is what. Yeah, there's no reason. Israel yeah. um, uses the one word of security to justify anything and everything it does. Mm -hmm. And this is not only, you know, vis-a-vis -vis Palestine, it's also within the country. And this is, right. sort of gets back to what you asked originally, why is it that the West is so enamored with Israel? Yes, yes. It's because Israel is this model of a completely securitized state. And this is what the West is aiming for. Right. Under the, in particular since, uh, uh, since 2001, since 9-11, mm. this is the kind of country that they're looking at and that they want to become. Oh, so, yeah, okay. this is what they're looking at. But anyway, I, I digress. So, you know, these kind of restrictions on Gaza, um, every time they did a military offensive, they would bomb the uh, electricity power plant, mm. which is also a violation of international law because yeah. that's a civilian mm. infrastructure. Mm. And it would, they would make it almost impossible to fix the thing because oh. the mechanical parts and, and construction materials mm. that were needed to fix it yeah. um, would be... You know, restricted would be prohibited by Israel. Mm -hmm. They use the word, the uh, the magic word security, and say mm -hmm. that these material can be are dual use, so that mm -hmm. they can also be used to I don't know, create weapons yeah. or create military. Like yeah. it's all very vague and, yeah. and just it's all nonsense. Really. Yeah, right. It's just it, it is just to make the people in Gaza miserable. Suffer. Yeah, to make them suffer. Mm -hmm. Really, it was uh, you know. 
people used to call, or people often called Gaza, and still call Gaza, the open-air prison. Yeah. And it very much was. But, um, you know, other people could call it a, would call it a concentration camp. Right now, what's happening now is it's an extermination camp. Yeah. So, you know, that's, that's the attitude of Israel towards Gaza. And, mm -hmm. you know, we, Israel is completely unjustified in making any kind of restriction on humanitarian aid. They are completely unjustified in, mm -hmm. you know, saying how many trucks can come in. And yeah, what, yeah, yeah. No, no, this is uh, unacceptable. Yeah. They have to allow humanitarian aid. In mm -hmm. fact, they have to facilitate it. Mm -hmm. So this is really just, you know, completely beyond the pale. Mm -hmm. What people, you know, what people tend to forget, mm -hmm. um, or what Israel wants everybody to forget, let's put it that way, is that Gaza has remained an occupied territory. So they had an Israeli colony within Gaza. They had mm. troops within Gaza. They pulled them out mm. in uh, 2005. Yes. So that was, you know, and so they have, they, they, they like to say, they like to argue that since then it has not been occupied by Israel. But they control everything that goes in and out. Mm. Um, drones flying overhead. All the mobile phone conversations are being, you know, are, are being monitored. Mm. Um, they control the seas with warships, mm. make sure that people from Gaza cannot go out to fish. Yeah. Um, they it's like a, yeah. uh, is there nautical miles there? Yes, right? yes, yeah. exactly. They control the population registry, they control the mobile networks, everything. So mm -hmm. it remains occupied. And, um, you know, as, um, as uh, the people in occupied territory, and this, mm. is, this applies also to the West Bank, mm. West Bank and Gaza are under international law, they're protected persons. Yeah. Yes, which means that you know Israel has the duty, the obligation under international law to mm -hmm. look out for their basic needs and to ensure yeah. their basic needs. Yeah. Needless to say, Israel has never even pretended yeah. to do this. <laughs> which mm. I bet baffles. I mean, a lot of people currently. Well, if yeah. people are baffled, it, yeah. it's good because it shows that they, you know, they, that they yeah. that they see something is wrong. Yeah. yeah. I think a lot of people are only starting to realize yes, yes. this now with uh, social media being yeah. available and they're able to see for themselves um, the atrocities of what's happening. Yes, and that's, um, that's also uh, yeah. the main reason I would say that Israel yeah. always bombs the electricity plants because it mm -hmm. doesn't want people sending out you know, videos and videos video clips and of pictures. what's happening. Mm -hmm. yeah. I just find it like very shocking in 2023 that um, these methods are being used for war, like starvation. Yeah. And um, though they have laws uh, in place that this should not happen in this day and age, like these types of warfare, they do, right? Yes, yes, Isn't of it? course, yes, of course. Yes. I mean, right after World War II, uh, you know, the, the international community created the, the Geneva Conventions on the mm. Conduct of War, mm. and also the, uh, after later on, the additional protocols on the, to the Geneva Convention were also uh, made. So those were also, uh, those also lay out the kind of principles of, mm. of the laws of war, you know, mm. things that countries are not supposed to do. Mm. And then later on, uh, the International Criminal Court came into being, and that has also, you know, that also has a statute which which lays out the crimes that it is mm. supposed to be responsible for and is supposed to indict yeah. perpetrators for. Mm. And you know, with international humanitarian law, the laws of war, mm. um, the three big principles <laughs> are, yeah. the first one is, uh, again, distinction. So right. countries should never attack civilians. They should never attack civilian mm. infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And the second one is, uh, proportionality. So if they, mm. even it, so say you attack a military base, base yeah. and it just so happens that there are civilians, civilians that get caught, caught up in, in the attack. Right. Now that is um, very bad, it's a bad thing, and it's mm. very unfortunate, but it's not necessarily a violation. Mm. However, you know, when you're attacked, when you're, create, when you're carrying well, out this attack... Even if there are civilians around? Well, yes. Unfortunately, that, oh. is, how, that is how the laws of war are, because... Right. It is countries that make international law. So they are not, you know, very often they're not as, yes. they don't go as far as we want them to. Mm -hmm. However, what is very clear is that it has to be any forecast, any foreseen law, uh, fore foreseen loss of civilian life or mm -hmm. damage to civilian infrastructure mm -hmm. has to be proportionate mm -hmm. to the attack. So it has to be proportionate to the military advantage mm -hmm. um, that, is, that you can get from yeah. the attack. So, um, you know, 
even like, for example, the, you, you take out, um, if, for example, if they were attacking combatants mm. um, and it was a combatant base, it was like a Hamas, yeah. you know, uh, base. combat yeah. base with weapons and, you know, sort of like a headquarters type infrastructure, yeah. you know, it doesn't mean that they can take out, you know, hundreds, thousands of civilians at the same time. Yeah. You know, the loss has to be proportionate. And what mm. we see now is that by any definition, you know, in any mm. way, shape, or form, no way that this is proportionate, yeah. even supposing that they were targeting combatants. Mm. Um, and, you know, frankly, I think that's not proven. proven. I just don't think it's the case. I mean, mm. it's clear to anybody watching yeah. what's happening that yeah. they are intentionally targeting civilians. Yes. They are intentionally targeting, Children. you know, civilian houses, mm. Children, um, you know, people who were uh, ordered and, and forced to evacuate from the north to the south, mm. and then once these ceasefires started, they started moving back to the north. Mm -hmm. You know, they were shooting them with impunity, bombing them, etc. Mm -hmm. So, you know, all of this is these are they're targeting civilians. That's very, very obvious. And finally, the third principle, mm. um, because Israel is is quick to uh, accuse Hamas of using people as as human shields. Mm. Um, now, first of all, there's no evidence for that. Israel yeah. never presented any kind of decent evidence <laughs> yes. for that. As a matter of right. fact, the only evidence that exists in this regard is that Israel uses civilians as human, human shields, shields. Uh, in particular in the mm -hmm. West Bank. Mm -hmm. But um, there's been no evidence of, God, of Hamas actually doing that. But mm -hmm. even if, even supposing the other side were breaking the rules, mm -hmm. that doesn't allow you to break the rules. Yeah. So there's no reciprocity. Kind of long word, but you know, there's no reciprocity of this kind in internet in the laws of war. Yeah. Even if the other side is breaking the rules, you can't. You mm -hmm. have to follow the rules. So yeah. you know, none of, basically but what Israel is doing is <laughs> yeah, what Israel is doing is just obviously you know a litany of war crimes. Mm -hmm. of what's being committed mm -hmm. is is you know is the worst I've seen in a long time for sure. Right, right. So I've also read like uh, recently it's been raining uh, in Gaza, so yeah. people have been collecting rainwater. Yeah because they don't have enough water, the yes. water's been cut and stuff like that. But Israel is saying that this is not allowed, the rainwater is ours. <laughs> so it's just to, to that point, but mm. what do you think? Are, well, I, I actually haven't heard those stories in yeah. Gaza, but I know that in the West Bank, yeah. um, there are, of course, all these kind of issues surrounding water. You know, in the West Bank... But logically, it, it, yeah. I mean, logically... No, there's no logic to that one. Yeah, it's complete right. nonsense. It, yeah. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Um, and if it were happening, yeah, I mean, it would be outrageous. Mm. And, you know, again... But is this, I know from somebody who's been mm. following the war right. and the situation there, is this just how they are? Um, well, <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I mean, it, it's, it's how they have dealt with Palis the Palestinian people mm. since 47, really, or since mm. before that even. The dehumanization of mm. the Palestinian people has been going on really since... I would even argue since the inception of Zionism as a mm. political philosophy, and certainly since, you know, the European uh, European colonizers have been have been moving to Palestine, the Zionist colonizers and moving to Palestine, mm. and uh, starting off with their campaign of you know forced displacement and kicking people off their land and genocide. Yeah. You know, this has been going on. So it's 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 shocking. You know, yeah. you say it's shocking, and, and so are so many of the other stories that we hear. Yeah. yeah. But, um, you know, and look at the, if we look at the genocidal statements yeah. that have been you know, going on really nonstop mm -hmm. by uh, Israeli political leaders, mm -hmm. Israeli military leaders, it is shocking. They are shocking. shocking yeah. But this is, this is how Israel has dealt with the Palestinian people since 47 even. You know, even since before the state of Israel mm -hmm. was declared in 48. This is how Zionist militias, you know, Zionist militias already in late 47 were going around, mm -hmm. killing, pillaging, raping, burning down, village, burning down houses, mm -hmm. and kicking people off their land. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I lived in Palestine for five years, and, you know, it, it really is just outrageous. The, the Westerners talking about, oh, Palestinian incitement again, for, again you know, to hate Jewish people and in their textbooks. First of all, the evidence of this is zero. That's not true. It's not happening, I can assure you. But, you know, you look at any kind of sort of nationalist Israeli rally, like, for example, the, the, what they call Jerusalem Day, which is the day in 67 they took, took over East Jerusalem. 
you know, they come out waving Israeli flags in Palestinian neighborhoods, screaming death to the Arabs. Now, mm. and this is a chant. This is a chant that they go on, death to the yeah. Arabs, death to the Arabs, death yeah, to yeah. the Arabs. Now, in many countries, uh, I would even say most countries, mm. th this would be hate speech, and people would be actually be arrested and prosecuted yeah. for it. Mm. Um, but so, you know, this is, this is what it is. Unfortunately, this is the Israeli attitude towards Palestinians and how they deal with, this is how the Zionists have dealt with the Palestinian people since the inception of Zionism. Mm. And, you know, frankly, look, Israel is a settler colonialist state. Yeah. And like all settler colonialist states, um, it relies on a system of apartheid to maintain the domination mm. of the coloni colonizer race vis-a-vis right. -vis, uh, over the indigenous race. Mm. And basically, the, where it's heading towards, like all settler colonial states, is genocide. I mean, that's what settler colonial states do. It's mm. what the Spaniards did when they came to South America. It's mm. what you know, the European colonizers did when they came to North America, yes. and Australia, and you know, New Zealand, and et cetera. Mm. And it's, it's what the Zionists have been doing in Palestine from day one. Mm. So you know, people talk about the genocide that's taking place in Gaza right now, and yeah. for sure, mm. it's shocking, and for sure, it's genocide. There's no mm. question. But the genocide, in fact, has been going on since 48. Mm. The Nakba really has never ended, and it's just, oh. you know, it's, 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 it's continuing. It's just a continuum from 48 to not 48. Yeah. But uh, there's something different about this time around. I mean, in this war, we've been seeing like an information war mm -hmm. um, going on, playing out through uh, social media. And um, I think now there is an opportunity for Palestinians to sort of change the narrative and show their side of the story as compared to maybe um, a few years ago. Um, so do you believe that this Israel is losing this, this information mm -hmm. war? Mm -hmm. Because um, I read currently the Washington Post um, wrote an article that the hashtag, the Palestinian um, Free Palestine is, is like being used more than mm -hmm. The yeah, then the, the, the counter, I yeah, think yeah, it was, yeah, yeah. Uh, so. I can't remember exactly what the counter <laughs> yeah, was, yes. yes, but yes, indeed. Uh, no, there's, again, there's no question that mm. Israel has lost the, the sort of the war of narratives, if mm. you like, um, the battle for public opinion. I mean, yeah. I think there's absolutely no question, and, mm. and I agree that the social media, mm. the advent of social media and the ease in which people can record things and send yeah. them around, and yeah. you know, they're all over the world all of a sudden, mm. um, this is a huge, huge factor mm. in this. It's really, it's been a game changer. Yeah. And, um, you know, again, this is why mm. uh, the Israeli oppression uh, has been so severe. And mm. they've, you know, they've pressured Meta, for example, to mm. delete a lot of content. Yes, and I, and there's I, also I, like shadow banning. Yes, like, all of yeah. this kind of thing. They're doing it, mm. but it's impossible. They're fighting a losing battle. You know, mm. they, they've, they've lost the battle. Um, the writing is on the wall. And they see it. Mm. And it really is kind of, it's almost like, it's almost like hilarious watching <gasps> like the Western media and CNN yes. and MSNBC and right. of course Fox. You know, yeah. they still think that they're like the center of the universe and they, they, control, <laughs> yes. they control the flow of information yeah, to the yeah, populace. Yeah. Whereas people are not dumb and they, you know, they yeah. see these things and they just, they just don't believe them anymore. And again, like I said, this is why the Israelis um, bomb the electricity power plant every time they, go, they start this military offensive and why they've tried to cut the flow of electricity, the supply of electricity to Gaza from the outset of this military offensive. It's because they don't want you know, those kind of scenes, those kind of video clips getting out. It's because they want the rest of the world not to see what's happening. It's why they're targeting journalists. And it, it's not, you know, they're targeting journalists in Gaza yes. now for sure. Yeah. But also, you know, before that, I mean, you know, they were targeting journalists in the West Bank. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, they, they just, they're, they're afraid. They're just in intensifying it now. Yes, they're intensifying it now. What we're seeing now is a much more sort of intensified, mm -hmm. uh, 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 you know, offensive, a more sort of intensified sort of mm -hmm. model of what they've been doing up till now, mm -hmm. um, really. And, and also not just in Gaza, but also in the West Bank. In the mm -hmm. West Bank, you know, things have been getting really, really bad, mm -hmm. uh, much worse uh, even than they, than they were already. Mm -hmm. um, and that is because they figure that uh, the rest of the world is focusing only on Gaza so they can get away with as much as they can mm -hmm. in the West Bank. In the West Bank. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, the current truce that's been happening currently um, Israel's 
Prime Minister has said that um, he would resume after negotiations mm -hmm. or what's been happening. Right? So what happens when, when, when he says that it's, it's going to resume despite there's been an exchange of hostages and um, like that, when he says he's going to resume, like what happens after this truce? That what well, you know, I don't really know. I mean, I think, um, you know, I think they're just going to resume with what they've been doing up till now, which is, you know, bombing, killing, massacring uh, to no end. Honestly, you know, my, I actually believe that the, that the Israelis don't have much of a strategy. They don't have an exit strategy. They just don't have a strategy. They, they don't really know what they're doing. At the beginning of this military offensive, their, mm. their objective was very, very clear, and yeah. they made very little secret of this. Mm. That was to uh, empty Gaza, mm. to uh, kick out all the Gazans into the Sinai. Mm. They were talking about tent cities. The Americans were actually dumb enough to uh, <laughs> agree to fund like, you know, yeah. some of this. Weapons, yeah. And uh, you know, they wanted some of those refugees resettled to other countries. In the West. They thought that this was going to happen. They thought this was their great chance. Mm -hmm. Now, alhamdulillah, Egypt said, no way. Uh, the Americans maybe, you know, they, they, they pretend that they, they were never in agreement with this. I, you know, it's very hard yeah. to say. But for sure, it, Egypt was just not going to agree to this. So, mm. so they were stuck, and they had started bombing already. And they were like, okay, we're just going to kill as many people as we can mm. and just hope that, uh, you know, something will happen that we can declare victory and go home. I think that's kind of the attitude. You know, in the same way, Israel and the United States are very similar in that. Way. They don't have any solution to anything except brute force. Mm. And if that doesn't solve the problem, well, the, the solution is more brute force. <laughs> so it's just, you know, shoot your way out and, yeah. and you know, kill as many people and, mm. and all this. Mm. Now, you know, of course, but the United, you know, I, I wouldn't say that works anywhere, but yeah. the United States has the luxury of being uh, geographically very distant from the countries that it bombs and destroys. Mm. So it can go back home and just forget about it. But Israel doesn't have that luxury. It can't do that. I mean, mm. it, it has to, you know, it has to live with Gaza. It has to yeah, live with yeah. the Palestinian people. So, right. you know, it just is not a viable strategy. I really don't know what they're going to do. Um, you know, the Americans are saying that they're pressuring Israel to mm. sort of lay it's off and, like you know, be a, little, be a little bit more sort of, you know, kill a few more people, I think. Mm. A, few, a few, excuse me, a few less people or a yeah. few less civilians. But... Mm. You know, I, I, I don't know. I, think, I just don't think the Israelis have much of a strategy. Who knows what they're going to do in northern Gaza? I mm -hmm. guess they will create, perhaps the objective is to create this kind of security zone that no Palestinian will be allowed to enter. enter. Mm -hmm. But that means that, again, Israelis have to go there. Like mm -hmm. The Israeli military will have to um, you know, physically plop down their stuff in that yeah. part of northern Gaza. And that makes them vulnerable. They don't. Mm. They don't like this, mm. so I don't know. I don't know. Uh, but you know, they've they've dug their own graves. So they <laughs> yeah. have to lay in it. I don't know what's, what's going to happen. All like it, but I do think that, you know, um, like you say, the Israelis have lost the battle for a public opinion, and I think this is irreversible this mm. time. Mm. I think that we have already sort of we've reached a turning point, and mm. I do. I am sort of optimistic that mm. this will lead to a more just situation. Mm -hmm. Inshallah, let's see. You've um, advocated for a one-state solution, and there's also the two-state mm -hmm. solution. So perhaps you can tell us um, what is the one-state solution and what's the two-state sure, solution, sure. and why do some people advocate for a one-state solution? Yeah, sure, sure. Some people think it's like um, the two-state solution is more logical because, mm -hmm. you know, there's a place for you and there's a place for me. So, but there are also strong advocates of a one-state solution, so perhaps you can um, clarify that. Perhaps. Sure, yeah. sure. Um, you know, first of all, I, I have to say that you know, I'm not Palestinian, so I, yeah. I feel a little bit all sort of uncomfortable advocating for something, mm. you know, for a particular solution, mm. because, you know, it's not my country, so I, I yeah. don't want to tell. You know, Palestinians have lived for, for well, for centuries, mm. basically, having other people tell them what they should do with their yeah, country. Right. So I don't want to be part of that. But mm. I do believe, one thing I do believe mm. is that the two-state solution is not only completely unrealistic now, mm. it's just, um, it's based on a fundamental injustice. And, mm. you know, we, we can see that because, look, the two-state solution, um, 
in a very sort of internationally sort of legal way yeah. was really sort of solidified in 47 mm -hmm. when the UN, uh, basically the Brits uh, had the mandate over Palestine and they were overstretched and they couldn't handle it anymore. Mm -hmm. And so they basically f gave the file to the UN and said, look, you know, please just sort, of sort this out, come yeah. up with an idea. Mm -hmm. And so what we had was a situation where 96% of the land, um, 90, excuse me, 93% of the land was owned by Palestinians, yeah. right? Uh, the population was also uh, over two thirds Palestinian. Right. So, and, and I'm sure you've seen those maps where there's yeah, yeah, tiny there's, little dots, yes, you know. Yeah. Um, and, and so the UN's great idea um, was, okay, why don't you guys split the country in two and, you know, share it? Yeah. And that's a great, you know, and then that'll be really fair. Well, if you're Palestinian, you're looking at this map that the UN, you know, published, yeah. and you're saying, well, how is this in any way fair? Mm -hmm. You know, there was never really any serious problem when Zionist, um, you know, Zionist people were coming to Palestine, but, mm. you know, living as individuals and living in peace with their Palestinian neighbors. That was yeah. never an issue. But what, you know, the issue was when they came in an organized way looking to take over the country. Yeah. And so the UN steps in, and the UN, lest we forget at the time, was really completely dominated by, by the Western powers. Yeah. You know, they're saying, okay, why don't you just split the country in two? And that's the two-state solution. That is yeah. what the, the international community has been you know, they've, they've held the two-state solution to be the default option yeah. ever since then. Mm. But it is based on a fundamental injustice. And in any case, we see that it's, now it's basically impossible. And that is uh, because of nobody except Israel. Mm. Israel has completely, you know, colonized the West Bank. It has right. colonies. And, and I'm good, I, I, I don't use the word settlement yeah. because that makes it seem somehow legitimate. These are colonies. Yeah. Yeah. These are colonies that are built on stolen Palestinian land mm. for Jewish Israelis only, full mm. stop. These yeah. are colonies. And so they've got these colonies that dot all throughout the West Bank mm. and then security areas which surround those colonies. And look, yeah. we have 700,000 Israelis that are living in the colonies, including mm. East Jerusalem. Now that's already one in 10, one in 11 of the Jewish Israeli population mm. of the state of Israel. Mm -hmm. So that's how normal this has become, that's how normalized right. this is. Mm -hmm. And the notion that these, you know, these colonies are gonna be evacuated and the land is gonna be given back to the Palestinians is, mm -hmm. you know, it's farcical. I mean, it's just, right. it's just not gonna happen. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's where the one state solution, often called, um, often called the ODS, the yeah. one democratic state, mm -hmm. uh, comes in. So basically the whole, all of mandate Palestine will mm -hmm. be one state, and will be shared by the Palestinians and by you know the Israelis uh, alike. So, what this would exactly mean in concrete way, in a concrete way, in specific ways, a lot of people have different sort of ideas. Mm -hmm. All I would say, as a human rights uh, lawyer, is that there have to be. We have to make sure that you know. Should we create a one state? Yeah. We have to make sure that past violations are addressed, and we have yeah. to make sure that there is a true and just peace for it to be lasting. Mm -hmm. And for example, you know, the colonies, just yeah. look at the colonies. Okay, so we say, okay, we're gonna have, you know, uh, one state now, and that means, yeah, okay, we open the colonies to Palestinians. So, you know, the, if Palestinians can, uh, you know, live in the colonies if they mm -hmm. want, and then that's fine, that's the yeah. best solution. But we have to remember, you know, obviously that these houses are very expensive. Mm -hmm. And through decades of colonization, Palestinians, you know, the Israeli economy has become inflated and the Palestinian yeah. economy has been destroyed. Right. So people can't afford to live in these places. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm saying. And so, you know, it can't be just like, okay, you know, they can live in the colonies if they can afford it. No, it can't be yeah. like that. Right. And that's one of the big mistakes that was made in South Africa. Mm -hmm. Because in South Africa, apartheid was dismantled, mm -hmm. but the economic power remained in the hands of the whites. And that was the deal. That mm -hmm. was the entire deal. Yeah. So that has to be, I, I believe, addressed if mm -hmm. we're going to have a really true and just peace. What would you, um, because it's been going on for a long time, the, the recent one, like mm -hmm. for a month yes. plus. So what would your advice be to like the common man maybe of, for advocating and amplifying Palestinian voices? Mm -hmm. Like some people feel helpless because all they can see is like what's happening on social media, but they don't, um, perhaps have the means to volunteer or um, 
they feel like they're helpless in maybe yes, changing sure, the sure. situation. Yes, sure, sure. Sure, What would you what would your advice mm -hmm. be? Well, I mean it's easy to feel helpless. I mean you see these, you know, these videos and pictures of people massacred and mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. children being pulled out from under the rubble and yeah. it, it really is awful and terrible. But it's important, I believe, that we, you know, uh, translate that into concrete action and not get frozen and helpless. Yeah. And there's a lot that people can do. There's a lot the normal, you know, citizen can do. Mm. Um, I think already listening to this podcast is mm. a start because it shows that people are, you know, interested in the in the issue and they want to educate themselves and mm -hmm. want to find out what this is all about. Mm -hmm. And so, really, it's it's about you know, learning more about it and politically organizing, really mm. organizing. Um, organizing themselves, uh, you know, there are a lot of different organizations also mm -hmm. in Malaysia and also you know, in every country mm -hmm. that are advocating for Palestinian rights. So I would just say, you know, get involved with those organizations and, mm -hmm. and make sure that your voice is heard in parliament and mm -hmm. in, you know, uh, in, in the hallways of power, because mm -hmm. this is, you know, influencing those people and, and changing their, mm -hmm. um, you know, influencing them into, you know, taking an even stronger stance on Palestinian rights, that's what's important. I know the government of Malaysia has been very strong on this mm. and, and, you know, that, that's wonderful. I think it's, mm. you, you know, think I think we could should, be doing more? Well, you could always do, <laughs> I mean, you know, you could always do more, I think. Yeah. I think because, you know, it's wonderful that the government of Malaysia is a strong advocate of Palestinian mm. rights. It's wonderful that, that, you know, even now they do not have relations with the State of Israel. But I think it's also about, getting like-minded states together and yeah. creating a, a united common front. Um, you know, I, I, I think that the, the, you know, the predominantly Muslim countries in the yeah. UN, you know, we like to think, you know, we like to call ourselves the one Ummah and say that, you know, we're, we're united, <laughs> but of course it's not always the case. Yeah. But uh, I think we should, you know, I, I, I think the government of Malaysia is a natural, one of the natural leaders to do this and to forge greater unity amongst uh, amongst the Muslim countries. Okay, um, unfortunately that's the, okay. all the time that we have okay. today. Thank you very much for well, joining you. us, Professor. Um, thank you for tuning in and uh, join us for the next episode of the Palestinian Diaries. Thank you.